Welcome to Biochem 18. Let's get warmed up. First question says, describe what light reflexes will be seen in both eyes if the right oculomotor nerve is damaged. So this is known as an efferent defect. So the right eye will not respond to light that's shown in either eye, but the left eye will constrict when a light is shown in either eye. Next, what's the differential diagnosis for eosinophilia? So the mnemonic is DNAACP. So D is for drugs, N is for neoplasm, the first A is for atopic diseases like allergy and asthma and Churg-Strauss disease. The second A is for Addison's disease or primary adrenal insufficiency. The third A is for acute interstitial nephritis. The C is for collagen vascular diseases. The P is for parasites such as Loeffler's eosinophilic pneumonitis from various helminthic infections such as Ascaris or strongyloides and various hookworms. And the last one, what substances act on smooth muscle myosin light chain kinase and how does this affect blood pressure? So we had the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, epinephrine acting at beta-2 receptors, and prostaglandin E2. And all these relax vascular smooth muscle, and that leads to vasodilation and a decrease in blood pressure. So that's it for the quiz. Let's move on to the lecture. Oh, I'm afraid you've caught me at home. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our step one video on water-soluble vitamins. Please excuse my casual attire. When I get off from a hard day's work at DIT, I just like to come home and relax. You know, like just hang out with my tigers. This one's named McGinnis. He's not very bright. Now I've just got to say, you've all done an amazing job studying so far. And because you're such an impressive student, DIT is gonna send you a tiger. No, we're not. Travis, how'd you get my house? We don't have any tigers. What do you mean we don't have any tigers? We just don't. Well, just go down to the store and get some. You can't just buy a tiger at the store. Sure you can. You know, just talk to the guy, ask him if they have any in the back or something. Put out a little effort, Travis. This might be why you don't have any tigers. Whatever. Students, don't worry. I'm all over this. And remember, in life, never settle for anything less than tigers. Alright guys, so in this video we're going to talk about water-soluble vitamins, which includes all of your B vitamins. It also includes vitamin C, but since we already talked about vitamin C with the antioxidants, uh, we're not going to reiterate that one here. So let's get started here. First one here, vitamin B1, uh, also known as thymine. So the active form of B1 is thymine uh, pyrophosphate, and it has a ton of important functions. So here we go here. So from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, that's going to be catalyzed by pyruvate uh, dehydrogenase. You need thymine there. Alpha-ketoglutarate to succinyl-CoA is catalyzed by alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Again, you're going to have to uh, use thymine there as well. Now you can actually use the mnemonic tender loving care for nobody uh, for the required cofactors for pyruvate dehydrogenase and uh, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Well, the thymine is the tender uh, part of that mnemonic. And then ribose 5-phosphate to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, that's again going to be cal cat uh, catalyzed by transketolase. And again, that's in the pentose phosphate pathway, and that reaction again requires thymine. So lots of things for thymine. So you do need to know these enzymes, and even more importantly, you need to know what happens with thymine deficiency. So thymine deficiency occurs in the setting of poor nutrition, so something like alcoholism, we're not eating enough, or maybe malabsorption, or increased uh, uh, loss of water-soluble vitamins, like if you're uh, a dialysis patient. Now, as we saw before, thymine is extremely important in oxidative metabolism. So if you don't have thymine, then you can't break down glucose and form ATP. So organs like the brain tend to be affected first. Also, in the absence of thymine, uh, there tends to be more damage to the medial thalamus and the mammillary bodies of the posterior hypothalamus, as well as generalized uh, cerebral atrophy. Now, patients can get what's called Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, and this can be a little bit confusing because this is actually two different syndromes, each representing a different stage of the disease. Wernicke encephalopathy is an acute syndrome, and then Korsakoff syndrome uh, is uh, the uh, chronic neurologic condition that usually occurs as a consequence of that Wernicke encephalopathy. So first, what is Wernicke encephalopathy? Well, the classic triad that you need to remember is encephalopathy, it's in the name, ocular motor dysfunction, and then gait ataxia. Now, patients can also have stupor, they can have coma, they can have hypotension, and they can get uh, hypothermia. It's a very dangerous situation. 
Now, Korsakoff syndrome, as we said before, is that chronic consequence of Wernicke encephalopathy, and it has several symptoms as well. Memory loss, and this is retrograde and interior grade amnesia. So uh, you uh, can't really remember things in your past, nor can you create new memories. You can get something called confabulation. So this is where the patient invents memories uh, that he then believes are true, and this is really just to fill in those memory gaps. You can also see some personality changes, and then you can get a lot of apathy as well. And just to make this a little more confusing, in addition to Wernicke-Korsakoff, patients can also get beriberi. Now, historically, beriberi is seen in areas where, uh, the pe where people's primary source of food is something called polished or dehusked rice. Uh, when you remove the husk, you remove the thymine. Now, beriberi is described as either wet beriberi or dry beriberi. Now, dry beriberi symptoms are going to include things uh, kind of nonspecific. Peripheral neuropathy uh, with myelin degeneration. You can get toe drop, a wrist drop, foot drop. You can get muscle weakness in general as well, and some hyporeflexia uh, and areflexia. Now, what about the wet beriberi? So here you can have peripheral vasodilation. That's going to lead to high output heart failure. You're also going to get some peripheral edema as well and cardiomegaly. So the dry beriberi is involving the nerves, and the wet beriberi is involving the heart. Now, treatment will obviously involve immediate thymine supplementation. Now, one very important treatment point is that uh, giving glucose to a thymine deficient or near thymine deficient uh, patient uh, can actually worsen uh, the Wernicke encephalopathy. Encephalopathy. So anyone who is at risk for a thymine deficiency should always get a thymine before glucose. All right, so that's enough about thymine. Let's move on to vitamin uh, B2. This is also known as riboflavin. So there are two biologically active forms of riboflavin. Uh, riboflavin can be flavin mononucleotide, or FMN, uh, and then it can also be flavin uh, adenine dinucleotide, so FAD. Now, both of these are cofactors for redox reactions. So if the enzyme has the word dehydrogenase in it, then it requires B2 as a cofactor. Now, what are the symptoms associated with riboflavin deficiency? Well, you're going to have dermatitis. You're going to have uh, chelosis. You're going to have angular uh, stomatitis. And then also glossitis of the tongue as well. All right, so let's move on to vitamin B3. So this is also known as niacin. So vitamin B3 has two active com uh, compounds here. There's the nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, so that's NAD. And then we have that nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate, so NADP. So these, again, are important in redox reactions. Now, you might remember from our lecture on amino acids that these are derived from tryptophan. So if you can make your own niacin if you have your own tryptophan. Now, what diseases, again, are going to be caused by that niacin deficiency? Remember, this is going to be pellagra. We touched again on this before. Here you have your three Ds of vitamin B3 deficiency. Remember, the Ds are dermatitis, diarrhea, and dementia. Now, vitamin B3 deficiency can occur from a dietary deficiency, but it's also important to remember here that pellagra can be caused by heart nut disease, uh, which is decreased tryptophan absorption. Uh, you can also get it from a malignant carcinoid syndrome, so that's an increased tryptophan metabolism, and then INH, so which is going to inhibit uh, both B6 and B3. Now, this is covered more often uh, in our uh, lipid lectures, but recall that niacin is commonly used in patients with cholesterol problems. Niacin is going to raise your HDL, and it's also going to lower your LDL slightly as well. Uh, it does, however, cause a flushing reaction that you can help decrease by taking an aspirin about 30 minutes before taking your niacin. Let's move on to vitamin B5. So B5 isn't as high yield as some of the other B vitamins. It's also known as uh, pantothenate, uh, and it's a compound of uh, uh, coenzyme A, which functions in uh, the transfer of acyl groups. If you get deficiency, you get some uh, nonspecific uh, stuff, dermatitis, maybe some enteritis, alopecia, and even some adrenal insufficiency, what makes it a little bit different. So now let's move on to vitamin B6. Now this is also known as pyridoxine, and the active form here is pyridoxal phosphate. Now, what is the metabolic function of pyridoxal phosphate? Well, this is a coenzyme for a lot of different enzymes, including those uh, of amino acid metabolism. So this is involved in a lot of transaminations and deaminations. Now, B6 is also important in converting amino acid precursors into a lot of things, into heme, into niacin, into histamine, GABA, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, a ton of stuff. So then what are you going to see clinically uh, with a B6 deficiency? Well, you're going to see many of the same symptoms as riboflavin deficiency, like angular uh, chelosis around the uh, lips and glossitis of the tongue. But one thing that's unique to B6 deficiency is a lot of convulsions and hyperirritability and peripheral neuropathy. Uh, and the convulsions occur because B6 is essential, as we said before, in the creation of GABA. Remember, GABA is that main inhibitory neurotransmitter of the brain. So GABA kind of keeps the brain quiet, and without it, you might end up with convulsions. 
Now, as we saw with vitamin B3, isoniazid, INH, can induce a deficiency of B6. So if a patient is re, uh, receiving treatment for tuberculosis, then we often add on vitamin B6 to the other antibiotics. All right, moving on to vitamin B7. So vitamin B7 is biotin. Uh, so what is its metabolic role? Well, it's an uh, apoenzyme for carboxylation reactions. So if you want to add a CO2 to something or bring a carboxyl group uh, to something, then you're going to use biotin. And the mnemonic biotin of CO2 uh, for biotin and CO2 is helpful to remember this one. Also, if you see an enzyme with the word carboxylase in it, then it's probably going to require a B7 or biotin as a cofactor as well. So what can cause a deficiency of biotin? Uh, well, there's a, a glycoprotein called uh, avidin found in uh, egg whites that prevents absorption of biotin. So if you have to maybe eat a ton of eggs, like if you're weightlifting, then that might actually get you to the point where you might have a biotin deficiency. Antibiotic use can also result in a biotin problem as well. All right, moving on, vitamin B9. So this is folic acid, sometimes referred to as folate. Uh, simply put, folic acid is crucial for the synthesis of DNA and the repair of DNA. It's also essentially and especially important uh, in the synthesis of purines and pyrimidines. Now, folate is very important for rapid cell division and growth. And its biologically active form is tetrahydrofolate, uh, which is a coenzyme for one carbon transfer or methylation reactions. Now, humans are unable to synthesize their own folic acid, and therefore we have to get our supply through the diet. Now, what about a folic acid deficiency? Here's the high-yield stuff. How does that occur? Well, most of the time, folic acid deficiencies are due to medications or malnutrition. Drugs like phenytoin, like sulfonamides, like trimethoprim, and methotrexate. These can all cause a folic acid deficiency. Now, what's nice is that you can actually counteract many of these effects by giving supplemental uh, folic acid uh, in most cases. Now, folic acid can be low in pregnancy because of the rapid growth of the fetus. So the fetus is requiring a lot of folic acid to rapidly divide its cells. Uh, but what are the actual consequences of that folic acid deficiency? Well, if you have a folate deficiency in utero, then the baby might develop a neural tube defect. And the folate deficiency is the most common cause of a neural tube defect. And that's why it's very important to supplement uh, folate even before a woman plans on becoming pregnant to prevent this. Now, if you have a folate deficiency while you're growing up, then you can actually have growth failure. Uh, as an adult and also as a child with a folate deficiency, you can have a megaloblastic anemia uh, because folate is uh, just so essential to those rapidly dividing cells. And then there are some nonspecific findings like glossitis, diarrhea, depression, and confusion. All right, so let's take a quick moment to discuss megaloblastic anemia. So this is an anemia, but those RBCs are really big. Uh, you have a type of macrocytic anemia, which means large red blood cells. And this anemia, which is characterized by that elevated number of megaloblasts, is going to be found in the marrow. Now, under the microscope, you often see hypersegmented neutrophils right alongside those large RBCs. Now, what's the other vitamin deficiency that's going to lead to a megaloblastic anemia? Well, that's going to be vitamin B12, which we're going to move on to right now. So vitamin B12, also known as cobalamin. Uh, so this is, again, a very important vitamin because vitamin B12 is a cofactor with a homocysteine methyltransferase to convert homocysteine to methionine. Now, also in the process, tetrahydrofolate is produced. Now, where did we just see that? Well, remember, that's the active form of folate. Also, a conversion of methylmalonyl-CoA to succinyl-CoA actually requires B12 as well. So what are we going to see with a B12 deficiency? Well, just like with our folate deficiency, again, we're going to see that megaloblastic anemia with hypersegmented neutrophils. But how can you determine if a megaloblastic anemia is caused by folate or a B12 deficiency? Well, you can check the serum level. So you can check a serum B12 level. You can also check a serum folate level. Now, if the B12 level is low normal, then you can also check a couple other things. You can check for an elevated uh, methyl mal uh, malonic acid, or MMA, or an elevated homocysteine level. Now, that MMA requires B12 to be metabolized. So it's going to be elevated when B12 levels are inadequate. Homocysteine can be elevated in a number of diseases, but as we just learned, B12 is needed to convert homocysteine to methionine. Now, what other symptoms can you have with a B12 deficiency? Well, patients can have a neurological symptom. They can have paresthesias. They can have ataxia, and that's due to loss of vibration and pos uh, position sense. They can have memory loss. They can have dementia and even severe weakness. Now, many of these symptoms seem to be linked to a defect in myelin formation, uh, which can occur with a B12 deficiency. Now, this is another big differentiating characteristic from folate deficiency. So remember, both B12 and folate uh, showed us that megaloblastic anemia. But only B12 deficiency will have that neurological symptom as well.
So how does one become deficient in B12? Well, first you need to know that B12 is only found in animal products. So strict vegetarians or vegans uh, can actually have a problem with low B12 if they're not supplementing. Next, you need to know how B12 is absorbed because the most common cause of B12 deficiency is improper absorption. So B12 is bound to intrinsic factor uh, in the duodenum. And then that complex is then absorbed in the terminal ileum. Now it's also important to remember that the intrinsic factor is actually produced by parietal cells in the stomach. So a major cause of B12 deficiency is pernicious anemia. So this is an autoimmune destruction of gastric parietal cells and antibodies against intrinsic factor itself. So without those parietal cells, the body can't produce intrinsic factor, and without that intrinsic factor itself, uh, B12 cannot be absorbed in the ileum. And then you get this megaloblastic anemia. That's why we call it pernicious anemia. Now, a similar scenario can occur with uh, gastric bypass surgery. So if you remove enough stomach, uh, then you decrease the amount of intrinsic factor that can be produced as well. Now, other causes of B12 deficiency include malabsorption problems, things like Crohn's disease, things like celiac sprue, and uh, severe enteritis as well. Anything that can cause interference in that terminal ileum can impede the absorption of that B12 intrinsic factor complex from being absorbed. So how do we treat B12 deficiency? Well, if you're able to absorb B12, uh, then you can give an oral supplement, or often we'll at least start with an IM dose of B12. Now, how, do you, how would you know if uh, this B12 deficiency was from, say, pernicious anemia? Well, you can check for antibodies to intrinsic factor. Also, you can perform the Schilling test. This is where you give a patient radio-labeled B12 and then test to see how much shows up in the urine later on. So if the B12 level in the urine is low, then you may have uh, an absorption problem. All right, so it's time for that end of session quiz. Let's go through those answers together. All right, first question here. A patient presents with convulsions and irritability. What vitamin deficiency is causing these symptoms in this patient? So that's probably going to be that vitamin B6. Remember, it's involved in producing GABA. Next, what type of anemia can be caused by folate or B12 deficiency? Easy one, that's going to be that megaloblastic anemia. Next, where is B12 absorbed in the gut? That's going to be in the terminal ileum. Next question. Which vitamin deficiency matches each of the following descriptions? So first we have peripheral neuropathy and glossitis. That's going to be vitamin B12, but you might also see that with vitamin B6 as well. Neural tube defects. Easy one. That's going to be folic acid. Dermatitis, diarrhea, dementia. Remember those are going to be the big three Ds. Remember that's going to be a niacin uh, deficiency. That's B3 and that's pellagra. Megaloblastic anemia, again, is either going to be folate or B12 deficiency. Pernicious anemia, remember that's going to be a B12 deficiency. Next question, which vitamin matches the following statement? So first we have used in oxidative reduction reactions, uh, so that's going to be vitamin B2, so riboflavin, uh, which is necessary to make that FAD and FMN. Also vitamin B3, uh, or niacin, which is also going to be used to make that NAD or NADP. Next we have used in carboxylation reactions, so this is going to be biotin. Uh, also, you have to remember that uh, vitamin K, which is a cofactor of the uh, gamma carboxylation of glutamate as well. Next, we have requires intrinsic factor for absorption. That's going to be vitamin B12. Used by pyruvate dehydrogenase and alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. The one I want you to primarily remember here is uh, vitamin B1 thymine. Next, can be used to elevate HDL and lower LDL. Remember, that's going to be B3, niacin. Deficiency can be caused by isoniazid use, so primarily that's going to be B6, but also don't forget about B3 niacin as well. Cobalt is found within this vitamin. Remember, cobalamin if B12, so this one is vitamin B12. And next we have critical for DNA synthesis, that's going to be folate and B12 as well. And now we have a few rapid fire facts. First one here, most common vitamin deficiency in the United States, that's going to be folate deficiency. If you see hypersegmented neutrophils, that's a feature of megaloblastic anemia from either B12 or folate deficiency. And then we have dilated cardiomyopathy, edema, and polyneuropathy. That's going to be wet beriberi, which is due to thymine or B1 deficiency. All right, that's the end of Biochem 18, and actually that's going to be the last lecture of the course for me. Uh, you'll see me in some warm-ups later on, and then we'll have a special final confrontation between myself and Dr. McGinnis toward the end of the course. It has been truly an honor to teach all of you this year. I'm sure you'll all kill step one and all become famous doctors. Thank you for tolerating my ridiculous intros. Remember that a good sense of humor will get you through a lot in medicine. Also, it's not good enough anymore just to be a smart doctor. You also have to be a good person as well, so be nice out there. God bless.